Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Thank you for joining the MIT Nano Tour. We are excited to have Jorg Slovin and his colleagues from, uh, with us today. We will be taking questions in the chat throughout the tour, so please feel free to add them there. Now I will hand the tour over to Jorg. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, let me um, get started here. I'm actually gonna, um, since we have a fair bit of people on here, I'm gonna um, make sure that the uh, participants are muted and um, you won't be able to unmute yourself, but if you have a question, feel free to put that onto chat so we can take it from there. And I actually have a whole bunch of my colleagues here with me today um, that are able to help in answering um, you know, questions as we go along in the tour. So feel free to reach out, ask questions, and, uh, and we'll see. So welcome to MIT Nano. Um, this is a slightly different campus tour from perhaps the normal tour that we'll have in the sense that we have equations, graphs, and demos uh, in addition to just walking through the building and seeing the space. Um, to get us oriented, um, uh, I want to start off maybe you know, just giving a, a little hint. Um, if you want to see both the slides, we have sometimes we have slides and camera and sometimes we have just camera. Uh, when we have slides up, if you go to the slide by side or side by side view in Zoom, you'll be able to move back and forth and make the slides bigger or smaller or the camera bigger and smaller. So it gives you a little bit of a sense for you know, where we are, if the slides are too boring, you look at the camera and set. Um, now, first question then to practice this a little bit is where are we? Um, we're in the middle of campus, but um, if you look behind me here, there's a number of different buildings and depending on where you were here on campus, you may recognize some of them. So um, as a little bit of a warm up exercise, if you open the chat window um, and type in some of the buildings that you may recognize or one building that you recognize, um, and then wait, don't hit enter, we'll count down and then we all hit enter at the same time and we'll see what happens. Um, so I'll step out of the view, give you a second to absorb the, the campus here and uh, type in the building that you see and on three we enter. One, two, three, hit enter. Let's see if anything shows up. And we have our, uh, our moderators who can, who can read out some of the, the building suggestions that, that we have, if there are any. All right. Assuming they can unmute themselves, I guess. Um, all right, so uh, if I'm looking around here, there's building 13, there's whole 30 block, there's building 9, 35, 31, 33, 37, 39, 36, 34. Um, and then below us here, building 24. So we are in the middle of campus. Um, and if you have been here, if this is your fifth reunion, for example, you may remember this. Uh, this was the construction site of MIT Nano. Now you can get a sense for where we are because you see the great dome behind us in those pictures. Um, so this is what Nano looked like five years ago, six years ago. Um, and then in 2018, October, we had the grand opening when the building itself opened. Um, and then over the next year, actually, we started to outfit the labs and started to bring equipment into the, into the building, both new tools for new capabilities, as well as existing equipment from shared facilities that were moving into MIT Nano. And we'll see a little bit as we walk through the lab, you'll see how that, how that happened. Now, MIT Nano is central in the middle of the campus, and that's actually quite done so on purpose. In some sense, it has been the most difficult location to build at um, because you're really confined by all the other building. But if you look at this map here, you really see the reasoning behind that. And that is we're really within proximity of pretty much every department at MIT. And the purpose of MIT Nano is to serve the entire community and all these different disciplines. And they're all within a one or two or three minute walking distance from MIT Nano. So users from different uh, disciplines can come, use the equipment here, go back to their, to their home lab and, and carry out their research there then. Um, and just to give you a sense for the, the magnitude or, or that range of, of diversity of disciplines, in the last 365 days, um, I'm just going to pick that as an arbitrary number here, um, we've seen you know, researchers from 37 different departments, labs or centers. And they came from 127 different faculty labs. Right? So a lot of different research going on from many, many areas of the Institute. Um, and you know, individually, this meant that there were 327 different researchers, postdoc, graduate students, sometimes Europe students in the building carrying out their work. Um, and they've used 146 tools 
um, and they had over 20,000 individual tool runs combined. All right, so hopefully it gives you a sense of the magnitude. Now, remember, we're still sort of in the early phases as we're beginning to populate the lab. We will expect, of course, to see these numbers increasing. And you know, something that's, that's really interesting here is, is the transitioning of research activities to MIT Nano. If I look at not just what happened in the last 365 days, but let's say pick a 28 day window and we slide that across time and we ask how many research groups have been using MIT Nano over a particular 28 day rolling window. Now, not everybody is here all the time, right? A lot of people come work intensely for a week or two and then go back to their lab and use the device in some experiment or some, some further studies. Right, so clearly this number is lower than what we've seen over the course of the whole year. But you get a sense for the growth, right? When we started opening up in the fall, bringing equipment in, you start to see the users come in. Um, and then of course, you know, now we're, we're, we're growing. If I add the tools that we are moving or have moved already to that graph, you see kind of the, the, the overall capacity here of, of people that are coming to the building, right? Um, and the convergence of these two graphs really means that we're getting closer and closer to accommodating everybody as we bring more and more equipment in. Of course, in this data, you also see the impact of COVID in, in March when MIT shut down and then over the summer when, when there was a gradual reopening of the research um, activities. And in fact, here you can see that about September, October, we were back to pre-COVID levels of, of research activity inside the building. And, and we've now grown beyond, right? Where maybe where we had about 65 faculty per month um, and we're now at about 85 or so. And faculty, I mean, you know, research labs, obviously the students and, and postdocs are the ones that carry out the work. Now, MIT Nano is really primarily for research. So graduate students, postdocs, research scientists, um, but we're also really excited to get undergraduates involved. And so we're, we're helping you know, run or uh, lab classes to get undergraduates into this space because it's really a very unique experience. And so um, this spring, we actually had the first time a fully in MIT Nano only fabrication class. Um, and so that was very exciting. It was one of the few in-person classes here at MIT. Um, and you know, for the graduate students and for the research, we, we are hoping to have this diversity of, of research um, that, that goes on. And um, what's really exciting is we saw that same diversity or range of students in that class, right? Uh, going all the way from freshman year to third year PhD and eight different departments, of course, one, two, three, five, six, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, and so that was really exciting. Now, the students, you know, it was really wonderful to see the students enjoyed it, both the, the younger students here saying it was really cool to be in the space um, and being able to work at MIT Nano because they often thought because it's so heavily focused on research that it was only for graduate students and they discovered it wasn't. Um, and then this comment here, which seems like a graduate student who said, you know, I wish I had my previous institution had offered this kind of class um, and being able to come in and, and sort of from a graduate student perspective, see the value for undergraduates, um, you know, and that stuff, yeah, or that's the stuff that sets MIT apart. So that is our goal, right? To, to offer these opportunities to the students as well, in addition to the researchers um, carrying out their work. And so with that, I want to now go into the clean room. Uh, we're going to have this rolling camera. So I'm going to keep dragging you guys around um, and you'll follow me. We'll go into the clean room and we'll look at different parts and we'll have a couple of slides in between. Um, and um, let me go off screen here. There we go. So first thing, of course, if I go into a lab safety, so I got to remember to switch my glasses to safety glasses and now that I'm leaving the conference room, going to the public space for the time being, I still have to put the mask on. So here we go. Now I'm ready. Um, one last look at the campus and then we'll, uh, we'll head in. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna start pushing everybody here. Hopefully you don't get too dizzy. Let's see. All right, I'm ready to roll. So we're right now in the conference room and we're heading out. Actually, this room is right next to the clean room entrance. So it's not that far to, to get to the clean room.
that's enough for this. All right, so now I'm standing outside the, the main clean room. The clean room actually is on, on two floors. We're on the third floor here, and we have a identical clean room on the first floor, and they're connected by a clean elevator. But this is the main way in. Um, so you know, let me, let's get in here. Roll through before the door closes on us. The door is automatic because it helps us you know, stay clean and hands-free. A lot of lockers here because you know people ex ultimately come from many different areas of the campus and uh, especially in winter when you have lots of gear this is kind of helpful all right so the first step when we go into the clean room what you'll discover is that we'll we'll be gowning up we'll cover the entire body we only have eyes only coming out and um so you'll see why this is um, as we go along and i'll explain later why we worry about this um, I'm starting with the gloves here, and then I'll, uh, I'll go from there. So the most dirty part, in some sense, are the shoes, because who knows what I was running through. So I'm going to put on these blue booties that you can see here now. I'll then take a little bit of a hairnet. Um, anything that I bring into the clean room has to be cleaned before. So if I bring in my cell phone, I got to wipe it down with, with isopropyl alcohol. There we go. And I already have safety glasses on. So I'm gonna now bring the camera over and then we can see. So a gowning room in the clean room is typically um, split into two parts. Uh, the first part is the pre-gown area that we're in now. And then the second part is the actual gowning room. Um, and the pre-gown area is essentially to get ready to go into the gowning space that you're seeing over here. So let's walk in. This is actually already a clean room. Um, and what you're seeing here are hangers. These are the suits that the students would be wearing inside the lab. Um, and uh, I just have to get down up. So take me a minute. It really consists of three parts, putting on this napkin looking item here, the, the hood. Um, and then putting on a full body suit and shoes on afterwards. Um, just gonna make sure that I do this right. So step in here. When you do this a few thousand times, you get a little bit faster at it, but um, initially it's a little slower than that perhaps. So there we go. Now for boots, Gotta grab my boots here. Tangled up. All right. Perfect. Sorry about that. Good pair. So put on the boots. Right, now I've taken my glasses off and I'll put them back on. There we go. So now I'm ready to go into the kingdom. Um, notice everything is covered up except for my eyes, and even those are covered up with the safety glasses. So I'll just move a bench out of the way. always the hard part trying to get through doors with this massive tripod but the nice thing is in the clean room doors are very slow um, and they're very slow on purpose because you want to make sure that you don't disturb the airflow like a fast door would create a whole bunch of world um, a slow door doesn't do that all right so we're now in the main clean room we have actually a uh, the same structure on the first floor and we'll go to the first floor later on 
behind you or behind that direction there is actually the cleanroom elevator. If you look at the structure as we walk through, you'll see that it's essentially like an E-shape and it's an alternating structure of what's called a bay and a chase. All the tools, all the users, if you do research, you're in a bay. Um, the chase is essentially the structure where equipment maintenance can happen and where the infrastructure comes in. And that's done on purpose because we have, we have essentially above us here, these are HEPA filters that create clean air um, and that blows and recirculates. And we'll see in a couple of slides here um, what that actually involves. But I wanna show you first a little overview of the building and so this is a cross section of MIT Nano. And um, what you're seeing here, we're in the clean room on the third floor. We got another clean room on the first. On level two and four, this is all of the support space for the clean room. Um, and so it's really just there to support the clean space. On the basement, we have the imaging uh, facilities and they're there for, on a, for a good reason because down in the basement is usually where it's the quietest in terms of vibration, noise, and other disturbances. And then fifth floor prototyping, undergraduate teaching for chemistry. Um, and then on the sixth floor, the penthouse is where all of the mechanical um, action is going on. And so, you know, if you think about a clean room and things that you need inside a clean room, you really need two things, clean air and clean water and or cleanliness and stability, clean air, clean water and stable temperature, stable humidity. We can put numbers to that and see that's about four orders of magnitude cleaner air and water than what you would have in your regular you know, building. Same thing for temperature, much more stringent temperature and humidity controls because otherwise chemistry doesn't work or the expansion of material creates problems if the temperature is not well controlled. Now the clean room itself, and as we go through this, you'll notice the structure. Um, in this yellow space in this diagram, this is where we are working. This is where I am right now. Above me are HEPA filters. They blow air straight down in a form of laminar flow. That's actually quite important because laminar flow means that you don't have turbulence. You don't cross flow lines. So if I'm over here being a little bit messy, it will not contaminate things that are over there. And that's very critical right? because one source of contaminant will be isolated from the next. Now the air recirculates. And in fact, um, if you're looking at your house, you may get about two, uh, you know, one air exchange every two hours. Here in this clean room, uh, we're filtering the air and we're exchanging the air every 15 seconds. So about 500 times faster than what you would have in a typical home. Uh, 250 air exchanges an hour is what we have here. Of course, there's exhaust and makeup air that comes in and we'll see that later when we kind of get a glimpse of the overall facility. Okay. So hopefully this gives you a bit of a sense of, of the clean room and um, as we walk through this, you'll, you'll be able to see some of those structures. All right. So I'm now walking through the aisle and on the left side, these are the bays coming in. And every bay typically has a particular purpose. Um, so for example, in this case here, if I'm scanning in really quick, um, difficult to see because in the distance, but we'll come back this way later these are some edge tools that, that use all kinds of interesting gases to, to structure materials. And so heading back down this way, you notice that yellow light in the distance, that is actually quite on purpose. This is pretty much what you're, you're familiar with photography. You have a dark room because you want to you know, expose your film, not to regular light. Um, so same thing here to structure materials. Um, we actually use UV light. And so this is, yellow light to filter out anything blue and UV that could interfere with those kind of processes. Um, all right. Let me uh, go back to the screen. What I wanna do now actually is tell you a little bit about the clean room and cleanliness um, and, and how that, that works. I'm gonna actually go this way and we'll look in the other direction, sorry for the dizziness here. Let's see if that works, okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the slides. What I wanna do is um, explain to you why I am wearing this whole outfit. And it's really all about controlling particles. And um, 
you know, to give you an example of why that is so important, here is a micro or nanofabricated uh, wafer that contains a grading for an X-ray spectrometer. So it's actually scheduled to launch on a NASA rocket at the end of July. And so what you're seeing here is very, very fine lines that you really can't see, but you see the aggregate, the, the diffraction pattern that it creates. And you see a couple of small dots. Those are imperfections, those are defects that maybe come from particles or other, other things happening. Now, if this was not built in a clean room, this would be nowhere near as perfect and pristine as what you're seeing here. And of course, that would be a disaster because then efficiency of this grading would be lower, jeopardizing the science that goes on afterwards. So it's very important that we have a clean environment so we don't have dust land on our samples, so we don't get contaminants that ruin the devices that we're building. And many times the devices we're building are on the same size or even smaller than the contaminants that we worry about. And so to motivate this, um, I want to start off with um, a question of, of what is the size of stuff. Uh, now, you may be familiar with sand pebbles, hair, and pollen. And if I ask you how big is a grain of sand, you might pick one up. You can figure it out. You can tell me. You probably can tell me just without looking at it because you're familiar with it. Same for hair, right? So you might say, well, somewhere between 40 and 100 microns, maybe a millimeter for a sand pebble. Uh, but then there's other things in the air. It's not just, well, sand usually is not in the air, but you know, other things maybe are pollen. Um, and there's a whole kinds of either man-made or, or you know, natural dust and materials, right? Cement dust, bacteria, smoke, carbon dust, face powder, viruses, all kinds of things. Now, if I ask you, what is the size of a particle of cement dust? It's much harder to tell. You may have seen tobacco smoke as a cloud, but you really never have seen an individual particle of tobacco smoke. And so you really probably wouldn't be able to tell me unless you've studied it with a microscope or have done some other work in this field. And so the interesting part about this is what we have to realize that these things are very, very small. A tobacco smoke might be on the order of 10 nanometers, um, viruses on the order of a micron or less um, into the 50 nanometer range, carbon dust, couple of microns. Everything is kind of micron niche scale or smaller. And we worry about this. But how come we've never really, we have no intuition about this? How come that this is the case? So the insight I think that we should get out of this is that most particles are actually invisible. Right? We don't see individual bacteria or viruses floating in air. They're invisible to us. And because they are invisible, we never experience it, we never interact with them. And because of that, we have no intuition about them. And without intuition, it's very hard to understand things and figure out what to do. So we have to build some intuition. We're gonna do this in the following way. We're gonna have a little bit of theory first, then we got a, a practical demo here to better understand things. So the theory of, of, of dirt, what I wanna ask or think about it in the following way. Um, I want to essentially, you know, if you think about skydiving, you jump out of the airplane, you reach something called terminal velocity, right? You don't go faster than that because the air is going against you. And so how fast can a particle drop? Just like skydiving, right? So if I have particles and they skydive in the clean room or in a space, um, how fast do they go? Fortunately, people study this a lot. And so you can find equations about it. You can find data. Um, and so this is what I'm showing you here, some data from a paper. Um, looking at terminal velocity as a function of the size of the particles. As, and, and what's really interesting here is as the particles get smaller and smaller and smaller, they drop slower and slower, roughly quadratic as you see. Um, that's great, but you know, millimeters per second don't, still don't mean all that much to me. And you know, instead of looking at what's the terminal velocity, I wanna ask how fast does it drop? If I have my pointer here, and I'd le let go, well, maybe it takes about a second to drop to the ground. Um, so same thing for these small particles. How long does it take for the small particles to settle? Right? Essentially, I'm asking, if everything travels at terminal velocity, what's the fastest it gets to the ground? How fast does the dust settle? And well, this is just taking the inverse of that curve, and, and here's the answer. I want to highlight two points here that are of interest. Right, 20 micron particles 
settle in about a minute, falling straight down. Granted, this is in the absence of ventilation or, or filtration or anything else, no turbulences, simple gravity only. But notice if I go to a half micron size, that one minute turns into an entire day, right? So a half micron particle, which might be on the scale of the devices that you're building, will take an entire day to drop. And what I love about this is that the terminal velocity is reached in a single microsecond, right? So essentially, as soon as it starts dropping it at terminal velocity and it will continue to fall at that rate. Right? And so this is a good example of why we worry about particles because small things stay in the air for a very, very long time. Right? And so then the question is, of course, who creates all these particles? Um, it's not just the equipment in the lab, it's really people and their activity, us. I would create particles. And so we'll try this out on chat a little bit, um, you know, figuring out how many particles do we create. And I want you to just guess a number, your best guess, type it into chat and then hit enter on the count of three later. Okay, so the metric is how many particles per minute do you generate right now, just sitting watching on Zoom, okay? And so think about it. One trillion. Give it a count of one, two, three and hit enter. And then our moderators can give us some, some ranges where we're at. We have billions, trillions, thousands, tens of thousands. Awesome. A question about what size, a lot of people coming, 10 to the 23rd, 10K oh. per second, 100 million, a lot of good answers. So we're all over the place. Um, and that's, that's expected and that's important because um, if I ask you, how many people live in the US, nobody would say three, and nobody would say, you know, 5 billion, right? Because you have an intuition about that. But particles, you don't have that degree of intuition. So our numbers are all over the place. Um, the correct answer or the approximate answer anyways, is about 100,000 particles falling off every single minute, not molecules, particles, like right? chunks of stuff. And now if that sounds gross and you start moving around getting fidgety that goes up to about a million and then if you were to run around and do sports that can be easily 10 20 30 million particles falling off every single minute that's a lot of stuff and i, I don't even never realized i had so many things that could fall off me um so where do they come from all these particles well the one thing we have a lot of that is exposed to the the environment is of course the skin. And so an average person sheds about one to two pounds of dead skin cells every single year. And that equates to about 1 billion cells every single day. And that gets us to the, to sort of the average of a million per minute with no, with moderate activity. Now this is all solid things. Um, and in addition to that, we also have liquids, right? We breathe. And so you notice I'm not just wrapped up but the rest of my body I'm also have a mask on here built into the suit. Um, and that is to make sure that I don't breathe out liquids into the clean room as well. And so liquids are a little bit more tricky because you know, solids are easy. They, they do their thing, they fall, they don't change. Liquids can evaporate. There's all kinds of crazy things that can happen. But when you breathe, typically you excel, exhale about between 100 particles to 50, 60,000 particles a minute. And that's a huge range and it's driven by how you breathe, how fast you breathe, how, how extensive you breathe, and also whether you're, you're, you're ill or not, right? And so of course, in the last year, there's been a lot more attention on these kind of studies and these kind of metrics. And, you know, with breathing, and you know, one thing that's even worse than breathing would be sneezing. In the clean room, you don't want to sneeze. I don't want to sneeze and spray my sample, but um, you know, people at MIT study this. So this is a, a nice video of the, of the Baruba lab at MIT studying fluid dynamics. Um, and you can see here a very slow motion video of, of somebody sneezing. And you get a sense for the scale of magnitude of, of particles that are being emitted, right? These are all things we worry about in the clean room. Um, not just, you know, mostly people here worry about this for, for health, obviously, but in the clean room, we worry about this because it could contaminate our samples and destroy or jeopardize our work. So, Sneezing is not a good idea in the clean room. Coughing is also not. Breathing, well, we got to breathe, so there's not much we can do about that. Um, all right, so I'm going to go and um, 
actually run a little demo now. So we have here a small particle counter. And you know, because so many things are invisible and, and not very intuitive, um, we really, you know, when we're trying to explain things to students and users, how do we how do we do this, right? We have to have some some metrics, some data that allows people to, to really understand, get a grasp for what's happening. So if you look at this video now, um, what you see is a little display here that and that be red almost there we go. Um, so what this device does, it pulls in air over here um, about a cubic foot every 17 seconds. And then it analyzes it with a laser system inside and tells me how many different particles do I have, what size is, is present in this mix. So if I start this, now we're in the clean room, it should be clean. There shouldn't be much particle. Um, the MIT Nano Clean Room is called class 100. So that means there should be 100 particles of half micron or fewer. Now, nobody here right now, and I haven't made a mess yet, so it actually is extremely clean at zero. But if I were to come and, and start misbehaving or not even, maybe I'm getting too excited about my work and I start applauding my, my samples, you can see very quickly 2,000 things of small nature falling off, right? So those couple of claps generated 2,000 small particles and about 100 big ones, right? And that's quite, quite significant. Um, and so this is a good reason. I have my, my pointer here, and I tap it a little bit. Right, you can see all kinds of things falling out. So about 500 things coming off. Um, every 17 seconds it resets, so that's what we saw just now. Right? So having these kind of capabilities you know, really helps us in educating the users and the students and explaining to them why is it that we do certain things because it isn't always easy um, to, to explain things that, that, that people can see. Right? So that's actually really, really critical. Now, what I want to do next is um, take a walk through the genome and then we'll begin to understand a little or give you some insights into what's actually behind the scenes. Um, so if you're looking at, um, we'll turn around and then we'll walk out that way. So, let's see. And again, feel free to put questions on chat and we'll have all of our experts here who can help you answer them in real time. So now at the end of the clean room, actually, this is the, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six bay. Um, and this bay is what's called photolithography. So UV sensitive uh, materials being processed and equipment that can put very thin features or fine features onto samples like this tool here. Essentially a laser system that can scan a laser beam across a substrate and expose photosensitive or UV sensitive materials. And those processes usually involve wet chemistries to deposit these materials. Most of these photosensitive materials are organic in nature. So we'll deposit those. That is what we see here in these uh, in the fume hoods here because we don't want to breathe solvent so all of that work takes place in the fume hood um, and um, you know then once it is baked essentially it's like paint you paint it on through physics um, not a paintbrush and then you uh, you bake it uh, get rid of the solvent and then you can expose it with a uv laser system and then again develop it with so here develop it with with wet chemistry All right, so where I am now is actually behind the scenes of the clean room. I just exited the clean room. I'm still in a clean space. In fact, um, you see there's no more ceiling above me. Um, all of the air from the clean room that gets filtered comes out, goes through cutouts in the clean room and returns through this kind of space where it goes back upstairs um, and gets filtered. Yeah. Um, so what I want to show you is a little bit of an overview um, of what we have. Normally, if you're a student or you researcher, what you see is this, right? Let's say in this picture here, this is me standing at a tool, mumbling some scientific equations. Um, I'm working with a tool, and that's my, my world. Um, however, behind the scenes, there's a whole host of, of other systems, right? Really designed to not only create a pristine environment for the tool, but also designed to deliver 
all the different utilities, all the, all the infrastructure that is necessary um, to, to have for this kind of equipment. Right? Many different things, as you can see here. And so I want to give you a little bit of an appreciation for this and, and really highlight the complexity of the building um, in, in, at the same time. And I start out by looking at this, essentially, what is above my head, uh, the question. And so different things like exhaust, gas lines, and so on. If I were to go to a different floor and look at that delivery architecture, it would look something like this. This is actually from the second floor. And what you see here is a whole host of things. You have huge exhaust lines. On this side, you have water pipes for chilled water and uh, and, you, and, and deionized water. You have gas lines coming to the tools because many tools use corrosive gases to etch or remove materials or modify them. Nitrogen, vacuum, all kinds of other things. Obviously a lot of infrastructure for data and so on. So many, many things happening all running essentially like a big bus above overhead. And you can see that actually in the video here as well um, to the actual tool. Now, if I were to peel back the envelope of the building and ask, without any equipment inside, on October 2018, when the building opened, what did it look like? It would have looked like something like this. Right? So what this shows you is the infrastructure necessary to support these high performance lab spaces. Water, power, gas, air, exhaust, chemicals, all kinds of things that have to get to the right place and all have to operate in a very pristine and clean and high performance space. Right? So the building is really very much full of high-tech equipment. Um, and in fact, all of these systems in the building that are, are necessary to deliver uh, this performance are you know, hardwired and have, for instance, you know, we see about 10,000 hardwired input outputs um, from all kinds of different sensors, right? Whether that is a fan speed, whether that is a flow meter you know, or temperature humidity sensor, all kinds of systems that constantly tell a large collection of controllers what is going on, right? And that's about almost 400 control systems that help us manage this space and keep it at the stable point that we need it to be. As an example of that here, if I were to go up to the sixth floor, this is the air intake. And there's about seven of these large systems that pull in about 250,000 cubic foot of air um, every minute. Um, that's a lot more than your house, which might have, you know, 100 cubic feet a minute or something like a bathroom fan. Um, if I were to turn around in this view and, and go um, and look down, there's actually a huge air intake and it's really fun standing in that space. This is the one thing we can't give you right now, the physical experience, but in this space, you would feel that wind of 250,000 cubic feet of air. Today, it's a warm day, so it would be a nice warm breeze coming up six floors uh, through, the, through the building. In the basement, um, all the water systems. And so, um, you know, what, I hope you get out of this is the complexity of this of the space around us and the things that you as a researcher as a user you would normally not see. So this is the reverse osmosis deionized water system probably actually only about a third of the system is visible here in this particular photo. Um, on the left side there's essentially additional things and then behind me in that picture is more stuff right so a very, very complex system to deliver up to 40 gallons a minute of deionized super ultra clean water. And then, of course, you know, we have gases in the building, we have chemicals, we have exhausts um, and, and cleanliness control. And so we don't want to lose all of that when we have a power outage. So there is a very loud and fun 1.5 megawatt backup generator on the sixth floor. Um, and it's just a cool thing to see because, you know, you normally don't have that. If you have a backup generator at home, hopefully it's not this big unless you have a really big house. Um, and of course, that runs on 4,000 gallons of diesel oil and uh, can actually run for 70 hours straight. So if we were to lose power for 70 hours, you can maintain the building, not the tools, because they run on their own normal power, but the rest of the building, the fans, the controls, the safety mechanisms can run for 70 hours before we need to get a, re a resupply of the, of the fuel or, or power back. And so I wanna take a walk now and, and go back into the clean room. And, um, and then we'll make our way up to the first floor. So in that diagram that I've shown you, there were a whole bunch of complex tools. Um, and I wanna, as we go through here, I wanna show you just a quick glimpse of that. You can actually already, um, we'll take a little look, pan this way. 
And so this gives you a sense of some of the complexity um, behind the this, this systems, but um, we'll get a better view from it in here. All right. So I'm back in the clean room and I know that because I can see the filters up above. Um, but you know, here you can see typically a user would operate the tool over here, um, but then you see a lot of complexity. And the nice thing at, at MIT Nano is a lot of glass. So people get an appreciation for the you know, engineering and this complexity behind the scenes, which in many other clean rooms you usually don't get. All right, so we're gonna make our way to the first floor um, for that, we have to take an elevator, and it actually is a clean elevator. It is, uh, we don't have to degown and take the stairs. We actually just go through on an elevator without having to do all of that. All right. What I love about this elevator is that it's fast because I hate slow elevators. And uh, oh, it's a bit loud. When I asked the architect, why is it so nice and fast? Um, he gave a very simple, good explanation. It's a glass elevator and we're going to the mall and the glass elevator in the mall goes at you know five feet per minute. That's just really embarrassing. So if you ever have to put an elevator into your house, make sure it's a glass elevator. That means it's fast. All right, so we're now in the first floor clean room. Same kind of basic concept, but you'll probably see that it's a little bit taller, it's a little bit wider. Um, what we have here is the capability to process eight inch wafers. So for example, here um, we have a whole bunch of wet benches to do wet chemistry on up to eight inch 20, 200 millimeter wafers. So we are actually compatible with um, you know, the types of, of devices that you would see fabricated in industry. And um, I'm gonna park myself right here and give you a little bit of an overview so again, we're in yellow space, so we can accommodate lithography if necessary. And there's actually some systems behind us that we're going to look at. Um, okay, so something that I haven't mentioned yet, but that is really crucial to the success of MIT Nano, is the integration of fabrication and characterization, understanding what goes on. Because there's no point in building something small if I can't see what I've done and learn from that and improve it. And so imaging on the nanoscale is really critical. And um, now most of the high performance tools are in the basement because that gives us the lowest noise, the most pristine, quietest space. Um, and so you'll see things like a 300 kilovolt TEM. We have high performance SEMs that can also analyze the types of materials present. Um, I'll mention this in a little bit. There's a very, very cool nano fabrication system from Wraith that really merges imaging and fabrication into a single tool. Um, and then we have um, atomic force microscopes. There's actually one right here behind me that was just recently installed. Um, and there's also a system in the basement. And you know, what they do is they scan the surface of, of samples. Now that isn't necessarily, a, you know, that has been around for a little bit, but what is new about these tools here is the speed, right? Because what you see in this video is scanning so fast that you actually can see on the atomic scale, molecular diffusion. Right? And that was really, when I saw this video, I thought this was really, really cool because diffusion is usually something either equations or drops of water diffusing on the macro scale, but seeing diffusion on the atomic or molecular scale was really fascinating, right? And it happens with 10, 13 frames per second here. You can see, start to see things moving about. Now, in the basement, actually, we have the most high performance spaces, and they're actually really complex. And what I'm showing you here is a picture from construction. This is a view you'd normally never get. What it is is a huge metal box, shielded aluminum to, to shield out 60 Hertz electrical noise and higher frequencies. In addition to that, there is 
you know, that whole room and the whole basement suite sits on 5 million pounds of concrete to stabilize, right? Square root of K over M, your vibration frequency. So you want a large M to have a very low frequency of vibration. Now that little insert is that's the image when it's ready to go. Um, and, um, you know, the critical part here really is merging characterization and fabrication, right? Because that gives us new opportunities. And this example really shows this nicely. In this particular case on the left is a traditional method. Uh, EBIM lithography on the right is this new tool that we have installed here and it's been running for about nine months now um, that does it all in one step. And then when you're done with that, you can go into the basement, look at the TM and see what is it that you did? What are the atomic compositions of your structure, right? So really completely new opportunity by merging these kind of disciplines together. And that's really the core of, of a lot of the things that happen here at MIT Nano. So the last thing I want to just briefly do is to um, roll over here and um, talk a little bit about the fabrication cycle. So now we're again in a, in a space that has um, actually, uh, try this out. May as well do something in the lab while we're here. So this is a highly automated system. Um, this is a track that, that can code wafers. There's a whole bunch of robot handlers that can help us. So we don't have to do everything by hand. Let's see, I'm trying to find my pair of scissors. And so, um, you know, the lab has, has people actually in this, in the clean room use things all the way from three millimeter diamonds to eight inch wafers. So it's a huge range of, of um, substrates that people are working with. And there's different degrees of automation um, associated with that. Um, in some cases, it's highly automated, like in this particular case, this robotic system that picks up the wafers. Um, right now it's scanning the, the what's called cassette, picks up a wafer, puts it on a hot plate, moves it into a spin coder to coat it with a thin organic material it does all the work for you. And of course we have manual systems that where you can do this a little bit more hands-on perhaps, but um, you know, it's really a trade-off between speed and automation and accuracy and the ability to do things um, you know, with a bit more flexibility. Right? So clearly a three millimeter diamond device wouldn't be able to fit on this, but certainly for the larger wafers, this works quite well. And so as this is running, I'm gonna go and show you one last set of slides. The fabrication cycle um, really involves the following. In most processes, what you have is a sequence of putting down some material, patterning this, putting this thin organic layer on top that, that allows you to be patterned with, with UV. And actually the system behind me would be the UV pattern system for that. And then using that film to etch away the material you have deposited. So I might put down aluminum, put a thin organic coating on, pattern that organic metal layer, and then use that to etch away my aluminum underneath. And now I have created structures in aluminum. Of course, in between, I wanna look at what I've done. I wanna measure things. And this cycle may be repeated you know, 40, 50, 60 times if you're trying to build an industry, a you know, computer chip for your cell phone or your, or your, your, your processors. In academia, we usually don't have that long complex processes because we are more focused on discovering new uses, new applications, maybe studying new materials. So in many cases, one, two, three cycles are actually all you need to, to study something, something novel. And so, you know, after this wafer here that's in the system right now is patterned, you could write a particular design on it. And I'm gonna show you one example of that. So this is now, I'm putting the wafer into what's called the developer. This cloud you see is the exposed resist dissolving away. And there's a nice trick we're playing here. The developer chemical also attacks aluminum. So I have about hundred nanometers of aluminum on the wafer. And now the developer is attacking that in specific areas that are not protected. You see a little bit of the bubbles forming at the rim. That's the aluminum being etched. Now, once the aluminum thins down to 10 nanometers or so, you begin to see through it and eventually it gets etched fully and a pattern emerges. So in this case, actually it is the pattern of the MIT seal. 
Um, and in fact, if you go to one mit.mit.edu, you'll see there's a, a very cool project where we take the wafer and the whole pattern is made up of all the names. Everybody who ever was at MIT as a student, as an employee um, is on that wafer. Um, and together they make up that, that overall design. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.